Well, hello, men. Uh, glad you are tuning in for our online Ironmen. Uh, my name is Michael Rice. I have the privilege of leading our men's ministry here at the church. And um, we are now studying a series on the I Am Statements of Christ through the book of John. And so it's a great time to, to return to this important theme of, of who is Jesus as, as he defines himself. Uh, certainly, we, we see lots of people in this world defining Jesus uh, on various terms and various opinions. And what better place to turn to than Christ's own, his own words? And so uh, we're excited for the study. We hope you enjoy it. We hope you grow through it as well. If you would like to join us in person, we meet Wednesdays at 9 a.m. in the morning and 7 p.m. at night. We'd love to see you. Uh, have a great time even just fellowship with the guys. Also, too, if you're watching here and maybe from home, feel free to send me an email. Uh, you know, get a hold of me somehow. I'd love to just say hello and see it, see how you guys are doing and, and even meet you guys there. Um, so uh, we are excited for this. Hope you enjoy and that this is encouraging for you. Thanks. Well, guys, uh, before we get started and before I actually get into uh, <clears throat> where we're headed today, I do want to issue a challenge to you guys as it is the new year, okay? Uh, and that challenge is to be reading your Bibles, okay? Um, I was just talking with Gary over here about it. Gary is doing a one-year plan, and I'm doing one as well with my wife. Um, I'm doing one. There you go, right? Lee actually even told me that he was doing it on midnight when the new year came in. He's like, well, there's this old saying that in the South that what, what, it, what was it? What the new year finds you doing? That's right. So I was sleeping. Uh, but, you know, I do want to challenge you guys to be reading your Bibles this year. I think uh, that there's no more transformative spiritual discipline and beneficial spiritual discipline that we can be doing as God's men than reading our Bibles and, and being faithful and committing ourselves to being in God's Word. And so I think that helps us not only grow in righteousness, grow in godliness, but also to put off sin. You know, I, Scripture says that I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so um, how great would it be if us men, iron men here together, committed together to be in our Bibles and held each other accountable in that. I think our, not only just our families, not only just this group, but also the church as a whole would benefit greatly by having men who are committed to the word. And so I wanna push you guys to that. Uh, if you guys don't know of any plans, the church has a plan. Um, but also what I'm doing with my wife is uh, there's an app so, and it kind of syncs up between my devices. So who doesn't have a device on them at all times, right? Um, so like I can go and read really whenever I want or any downtime in the day, it's called read scripture. It goes through the books of the Bible, one book at a time. So you're not doing um, uh, Old Testament and New Testament. So I know some of you like that. If you like that, then find a plan like that. This one goes through one book, at the, uh, one book at a time, plus a psalm every day. The great thing about this plan is it has um, the Bible Project videos embedded in each day's reading. So if you want a refresher, you can click on that video and kind of see the larger context of the books that you're in, and you can kind of understand what exactly is happening. The great thing about my phone is I get once a week... Screen time notifications. Does anybody else get that? And it tells me how long I've been on my phone on average each day of the week, right? Rob said he turned that off. And I'll just say, I'm not going to say the number because it's embarrassing sometimes, right? I'm like, shoot, man. And if I could only just give 10 minutes of some of that screen time, screen time that I have, to being in God's word, uh, that would be tremendously beneficial. And so I'm gonna challenge you guys to the same thing. If you haven't started a plan yet, start one today. Don't worry about catching up the five days that you missed. Start on day one and you're gonna finish five days later than New Year next year, okay? Just get on it, 
And even here's a thing that I tell guys when I'm when I'm when we're going through Bible reading plans. Like guys will do a Bible reading plan and then they'll like have a busy week and they'll miss a week and they're a week behind and they they have this burden to feel like they need to catch up and read 7 days all at once in order to be able to catch back up and be faithful to their Bible reading plan. Guys, that's that's a lie. That's what keeps guys from reading their Bible, okay? You fall behind, great. Start back up again, do one day. And then the next day, do another day and just keep going. You're gonna finish late, but at least you're in your Bible, right? So I think that's really helpful. So uh, read scripture. Yep. Okay, so we're gonna get into it. We are in John 6 today. If you're not already there, feel free to open your Bibles. Uh, Man, what a great passage John 6 is. Like, I'm stoked to be in John 6 today. This is the first I am statement of Christ. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Now, it's interesting when we kind of ask this question, who is Jesus, right? Who is Jesus? How many books do you guys think have been written on who is Jesus, right? It's nuts. Everybody has an opinion. I actually typed in who is Jesus on Google just because uh, Google gives you like the, the amount of results that it comes up with. Guys, I had 2 billion, 40 million results, okay? In like 0.73 seconds, okay? <laughs> so... There is so many opinions, and most of them are out in left field, right, about who Jesus is. Uh, Just on the first screen there, I got things from Encyclopedia Britannica, Wikipedia, gotquestions.org, livescience.com, and christianity.com. What was really interesting was I went to Amazon and I typed in who is Jesus on Amazon and I wanted to see what books popped up. Uh, and I'm gonna read you some of the, uh, the titles of these books. The first is The Jesus I Know, which even that right there, okay, yes, we do know Jesus, but the Jesus I Know seems to lead you to think, well, this is different than maybe a Jesus of the Bible, right? It's my own personal Jesus, but it says, the subtitle is Honest Conversations and Diverse Opinions about who he is. So there's that idea about it being diverse opinions. Another book was, Who is Jesus? Linking the historical Jesus with the Christ of faith. And whenever you see historical Jesus, you should be careful, okay? Because that's saying that the historical Jesus is different than the Jesus of the Bible, right? Another one, I really like this one. This is probably my favorite. The Untold Story of Jesus, a modern biography, right? A modern biography of the untold story of Jesus. I'm like, man, you must be some expert on Jesus, right? That, that, that is Gnosticism, right? The, the, the false teaching, right? That was going on in the first century. The untold, first off, who wants to read a modern biography of Jesus, right? No, I'm going to go back to, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then this one's pretty good too. This one was a kid's book. The Spider Who Saved Christmas, right? The Spider Who Saved Christmas, right? Like a spider is going to save Christmas or uh, Jesus's birth in the story of God has anything to do with a spider, right? And uh, like it all laying on a spider. Well, guys, Uh, I say all that because we ought not to be concerned with the never-ending flood of opinions uh, from armchair quarterbacks and self-proclaimed experts on who Jesus is in fact, who he is. And that is really why I wanted to turn to this study of the I am statements of Christ, because uh, who better to learn who Jesus is than from himself? He actually proclaims numerous times throughout the book of John who he is. He reveals who he is and why he came. Those two things can't be separated. Jesus is who he is, and because of who he is, he is able to accomplish what he accomplished. Those two things cannot be separated. 
And as we are in the book of John, where it's going to focus on these I am statements of Christ, it, it begs even noting John's purpose in writing the entire book of John was so that we might believe in Jesus Christ, that he is the son of God, and that by believing we may have life in his name. So within this, John bears witness to Christ, but also Christ bears witness of himself, which is an interesting thought, right? Because, I mean, I was thinking about this as I was preparing my sermon. How many serial killers have said they're God, right? There's a lot of them, right? There's a bunch of wackos who say a bunch of things about themselves, and just because somebody says something about themselves doesn't mean that we should believe it, right? Now, Jesus does bear witness about himself, and his testimony is reliable. But the question is, how do we know that Jesus' testimony, when he says, I am this or I am that, is actually reliable? Well, Jesus actually talks about that. He says in John chapter 5, which is just the the chapter preceding the one we're going to be in today, he says, if I alone bear witness about myself, this is in verse 31, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me. See, even Jesus recognizes, don't just take my word for it. There's more testimony about this. And I know that the testimony he bears about me is true. Now, he's going to mention three things that bear witness to who he is. The first is John the Baptist. It says, you sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Notice that. John bore witness to the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. You guys even remember John the Baptist saying, behold, the Lamb of God who what? Takes away the sins of the world. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He, that is John, was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. So Jesus is saying, yes, John the Baptist bore witness to me, but I not only have John's testimony, I have something greater than that. And he says, for the the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. So not only did John testify to who Jesus was, but the what? The works, right? The Father's next, but the works bear witness to Christ. What are the works that he's referring to? The miracles, miracles, right? So if I say something that's questionable, and you're looking at me like I'm crazy, and then, you know, I miraculously heal you of something, right? You're going to trust me a little more, right? There's validation to what I am saying. So the works bear witness to Christ, and then it also says, and the Father who has sent me himself has borne witness about me. You guys remember even Christ at, uh, sorry, God the Father at Christ's baptism, even the transfiguration, there's witness to who Christ is all throughout Scripture. It's not just the words of Christ, but we can know that Christ's words are reliable when he says who he says he is because of these other corroborating testimonies. So then which should lead us to ask, okay, well then, who does Jesus say he is? If in fact his testimony about himself is reliable. And we fast forward into Jesus's ministry into John chapter six. And Jesus is at this point nearing the end of his three-year ministry. What's interesting about the book of John is it really skips Jesus's childhood, right? Matthew and Luke give some account of that. But John starts, and Jesus' ministry is already underway. And in fact, most of what we see in the book of John focuses on the end of Jesus' ministry. The whole, really, last half of the book is is the last week of Jesus' life. And so it's focusing on what is Jesus doing and saying at the very end of his life and at the very end of his ministry. And that's where we come to in John chapter 6. He's really at the end of his public ministry. Uh, This is the end of the great Galilean ministry. And what we're going to see is 
there happens in John chapter, uh, John chapter 6, this paradigm shift. Whereas people loved Jesus, people went and followed Jesus. They followed him, obviously, mostly because of the miracles. They thought he was this great guy. And then John chapter 6 happens, and he calls them to account for their motives. And all of a sudden, people quit following him, right? And so that's what's going to happen here. Uh, we'll kind of just speed through this uh, feeding of the 5,000 just for the sake of time. But you guys remember that Jesus uh, was in the, by the Sea of Galilee. If you were to look at the Sea of Galilee, it kind of looks like an upside-down pear, okay? Think about that. And Jesus is kind of on the northeastern side of the top, right, of that upside-down pear. And he there is teaching, and he feeds the 5,000. It says in... Uh, John chapter 6, that they were there. Uh, and so, let's see, where is it? Where, uh, I lost the verse. Uh, verse 11, John chapter 6, verse 11. So Jesus had taught for a long time, uh, and it was late, and the crowd that was there with him was large, and they had nothing to eat. And Jesus said, essentially, feed them, right? John chapter 6, verse 11, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many, right? We would plow through that real fast, right? And we're not even 5,000. Jesus says, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number, so more when we include women and children. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. Jesus had them gather the leftover fragments so that nothing would be lost, and it says that they filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. And so this is obviously... A miracle, right? This is something that no natural laws of science could, could do or replicate. This is something that Jesus did of his own divine power to feed these people after he had fed them spiritual food, after he had taught them. Well, ending that night, it was late, obviously. Jesus then with his disciples, well, his disciples take off before him. They're kind of crossing over to Capernaum. Uh, Jesus went up on the mountain and they cross over before him to go to Capernaum on the other side of the top side of the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus meets them by walking on the water to them. He gets there, and they arrive in Capernaum, and the crowd who was left where he had fed them realized that Jesus was no longer there, and they wanted to catch up to Jesus. And so they went searching for him, and they eventually came to Jesus at Capernaum. And this is where Jesus is going to confront them. It says in verse 22, On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had only been one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Verse 26, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. And that brings me to my first point, that Jesus did not come to give bread. Jesus did not come to give bread. What Jesus does here is he exposes their motives. And how many times are our motives linked to some sort of temporal or physical blessing when we pursue the Lord, right? Maybe even deep down in our hearts, maybe we don't want to admit it, but a lot of times we think, well, if I do this and if I'm faithful here and if I serve the Lord in this way, then maybe I'll experience some of these blessings. And, and certainly their perception of what a Messiah would be would someone who would come and rule, 
reestablish, you know, a, a type of governmental system that they wanted and bring revolution, if you will, and, and change things and rule there on earth. And we know Jesus' plan was not that. And he sees their motives and he says, you're seeking me only because you want food. They're motivated by their phys physical and temporal needs. And in doing so, they failed to see the bigger picture of what they actually needed, All right? Hunger can make somebody blind and these guys were blind, All right? I really do think that their gods were their bellies and they wanted to seek every blessing that Jesus could give except Jesus himself. That is the important thing for us to note here. They were willing to strive after meaningless things that did not last, and they would receive with elation and excitement the bread that he gave to them, but they would deny the very thing that they needed, which is Christ, with disdain. And we're going to see that. Jesus says to them, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. He says that is what you need the thing that will not fill your belly for the next couple hours, but the thing that will fill your soul for eternity. He says, which the Son of Man will give to you. Jesus here is telling them that this eternal food can only be given by himself, the Son of Man, for on him God the Father has set his seal. He's exposing their true need right here. It says in verse 28, then he said to them, uh, sorry, then they said to him, what must we be doing to, uh, what must we do to be doing the works of God? You even see the self-sufficiency there, right? Jesus says, you need spiritual food and by spiritual food only is the only way which you're gonna be saved. And they're saying, well, what, what do we have to do, Right? What do we have to do to be saved? Jesus, they're still missing the point. It's not by anything they do. Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. I want you to kind of pin that verse in your mind, okay? Take your little pin board there, take that verse and pin it up in your mind, okay? Because we're gonna return back to that. That we believe in Christ whom God has sent. That is the work of God. To be saved, we must believe in Christ. I like this, right? Verse 30. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What works do you perform? What did Jesus do just the day prior for them? He fed them all miraculously. And here they are asking him, well, Jesus, you know, if we're going to believe you, if we're going to trust you and do these things that, you know, you say you are and how we need to go to heaven, maybe you should do another miracle for us, right? That's what they're saying. What are they still caught on? The miracles, the temporal blessings, right? What can you do for me? And then they say, notice this, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're essentially saying, Moses called down bread from heaven. You just took some loaves and fed us. You're not as good as Moses. We want to see something Moses quality. That's what they're saying. Jesus then said to them, Truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. This is unlike the manna, which only lasted for a day and only fed the belly for a while. He says, for the bread of God is he. Notice not he, not what or it, but he. It is a person it is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. You guys remember John chapter one, that in him was light and the light was the light of men and that he came to give life. 
Jesus Christ is himself the bread of God. He's going to say that to them here soon. And hearing them say that the true bread is he who comes down from heaven to give life to the world. They said to him, great, give us this bread, right? You see that in verse 34. They want eternal life. But the problem is that they want what Jesus has to offer, but they don't want Jesus. They want salvation, but they don't want the giver of salvation. And seeking the benefits of Christ, they deny the giver of those benefits. And in denying the giver of those benefits, they lose out on the greatest reward, which is actually the giver, Christ himself. You guys, gentlemen, know that the greatest thing that Christ can give you is not heaven. It is himself. I want you guys to be reading your Bibles because I want you to enjoy Jesus. Right? As God's followers, heaven doesn't start when we die. It starts by living with the peace of God in our life now, today, and enjoying Jesus and the walk with him throughout our life. I mean, I think of Enoch, right? In the early passages of scripture that God literally just took him away because he walked with God. We gentlemen can walk with God today. These individuals though did not want to walk with God. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. There's no more clearer way to put it. He is trying to put away any false misunderstanding in their mind. Jesus has told them now, I did not come to give bread, but our second point, I came to be the bread. I, in fact, am the bread of life. And Jesus is going to make some shocking claims here. He's not one to skirt around the truth and to dance around it in an effort to not offend or to appease people's sensitive appetites. No, he spoke the truth and he told people with love what they needed most. And here he's going to make some claims of what these people need and he's going to speak the truth to them and some of them are going to get offended. Some of them are going to go, this guy's a whack job. I don't want what he's selling, right? That's how some of these people responded. And ultimately, it's because what we see, the father had not prepared their hearts and the father was not giving them over to Christ. But some of these claims, I want you to just look at, at them with me. Verse 35, we already read it. I am the bread of life. Notice this, whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Some of you guys, men, know the transformative, life, uh, transformative effects of Christ's life in you. It satisfies. He says, and it satisfies beyond the satisfaction that mere physical bread can give. This is an eternal thing that, that goes on into eternity. And then in verse 48, he kind of repeats the same thing. He says, I am the bread of life. He makes it clear to them. Don't miss out on this. I am the bread of life who also comes down from heaven out of God. Not simply heavenly bread, but from God himself, meaning that he originates and flows out of God. This bread is divine. Uh, one commentator said, he it is who came from God out of heaven and gives life eternal. He, speaking of Christ, sent of God on this mission for the world. To him, men must come. We must come to the bread of life. In him, they must trust. And thus, men eat and drink him with the result that they shall never again hunger or thirst. He is the mediator of life. Just like you eat a bit of bread and it feeds your body. So you eat of Christ and he feeds your soul. And he says, I have come down from heaven. Look at 
verse 33. Verse 33 even says this. We're going back a little bit. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven. He repeats it again in verse 41. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Look again at verse 50. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. He makes it clear here. He is not just the bread, but he is bread that has come down from heaven. And then as we saw there in the end of verse 51, that if we are to be saved, if we are to have life, we must eat of this bread, which is his flesh given for us. Okay, pop quiz. Does this mean communion saves us? Is that what Jesus is referring to? No, no communion doesn't save us because if I partake in communion and trust in that act to save me, what am I doing? Works-based salvation. I'm trusting in something that I've done to save me. So what Jesus is talking about here in eating of his flesh is not actually communion. Communion symbolizes that. It symbolizes a spiritual reality that's happened in our hearts. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. He says, you must eat of this bread to be saved. You guys remember I told you to put a pin in a verse in your mind. Verse 29. What is it? This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent to partake of Christ's flesh, to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, as he's going to say here in verse 52 through following, is simply to believe and trust that he is who he says he is, the bread of life, and that apart from him, there is no life. That's, that's what it is to believe. We must eat of that bread. Verse 52. The Jews then disputed amongst themselves, saying, how can this man give us this flesh to eat? Uh, sorry, his flesh to eat. They're really saying, you're not going to give me a piece of bread, but you're saying, I have to eat you? Right? You can understand their confusion a little bit, right? They're not seeing the spiritual metaphor that Jesus is laying out for them. And it's appropriate that Jesus uses this metaphor of bread because that is what we subsist by, right? Keep going. But verse 53 says, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. It is only by partaking in Christ through belief that we have life. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Notice this, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. He's saying, you do not simply need more bread, right? You don't need more donuts. Well, I do need, we do need more donuts, okay? Right? I'm taking that back. We need more donuts, okay? Speaking of that, don't let me forget, I got to get guys to sign up for donuts, okay? That was my tie-in. But we need Jesus, right? Donuts aren't going to do anything good for us. They sure taste good, though, right? We need Christ. We need spiritual food. And we need to partake in what Christ has to offer. That's what he's saying. You need to believe in me. And that apart from me, there is no life. He's saying to them, quit coming to me for things. Come to me for me. <clears throat> Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. By believing in Christ, he comes to live in us. And the life that he has that literally raised him from the dead is within us. 
as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He says, you want a miracle bigger than the manna? You're looking right at him. That's what he said. And this is going to feed you far better than the manna. Don't compare me to Moses, right? That's what he said. You need true spiritual food. How do you think they responded? They said, you're crazy. You're crazy. Do you guys know that right after, right after he fed them initially in verse 15 of this chapter, it says, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. He feeds them. They want to make him king. He tells them, you don't need more food. You need more of me. What do they do? Verse 66, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. They departed from him. They said, we don't want this Jesus. Verse 36, he he calls them out for it. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. It repeats in verse 41. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say I've come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble amongst yourselves. They were grumbling about what Jesus was saying about who he was. Again, in verse 52, then the Jews disputed amongst themselves, saying, how can this man give us this flesh to eat? Verse 60, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? And then in verse 66, which I already read, they turned away and no longer followed him. And why? Have you guys ever prayed for somebody to be saved? What are we doing when we pray for somebody to be saved? Yeah? Asking for their eyes to be opened, which implies somebody opens the eyes, which implies somebody prepares the heart, which implies somebody draws them and calls them to himself, right? Every time we pray for God to do a work in saving somebody, we're acknowledging that God is in control of salvation, right? And you know what? He is here, and Jesus calls them out, and he says, that they don't believe because the Father had not given them to him. Verse 36, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe and all that the Father gives to me will come to me. Notice that. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given to me, but raise it up on the last day. Again, verse 44, if you go down, it says, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, but I will raise him up on the last day. And here's this fine balance that we see all throughout scripture. God is sovereign. We cannot do anything outside of his will, but yet at the same time, Jesus calls these people and says, Believe. You need to believe. It is your personal choice. Believe. The Bible teaches both. Right? And they deny Christ. Guys, today we have a decision as with every day. We can decide to follow Christ or we can decide to be like those who turned away. And it says in verse 66, I'm just going to pick up there. We'll finish the chapter. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, here's this personal choice. Jesus is himself even acknowledging this. It looks like a paradox in our mind, but it's not a paradox to God. We don't have to understand everything about God. That's an important thing for us to to get our minds around. But he says, do you want to go away as well? He says to the 12 disciples, do you, like them, want to go away? Simon Peter, 
has some goof up moments where he really sticks his foot in his mouth and makes a fool out of himself. But this one shines as the best moment I think of Simon Peter. What does he say? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Because he realizes Jesus is the bread of life. And when everybody else is turning away, he says, they think you're crazy for your words, but I know what they really are. They're life-giving, and we need them, and we're staying right here. Right? That's where we need to be, gentlemen. Lee? One more quick I'd like to add. Yeah, just in there. Yeah? Good. Guys, let's follow the Lord, all right? Fun to eat donuts. We need to keep eating donuts, right? Those are our vitamins here in the morning. Amen. Rob's like, no. Actually, Rob's like, I want you to keep eating the donuts. That way you'll come to me. <laughs> no. um, but do you know what we need more? We need Jesus. We need the bread of life. Amen, guys? Amen. Hey, let's pray. Our Lord, we are just grateful for the opportunity to be here, to study your word, to trust you. We do ask that we would be like the disciples and realize who you are and trust your word for what it is, Lord. It is in your son's wonderful name we pray. Amen. Well, guys, enjoy some table time. <laughs>